Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects by Giorgio Vasari. Life of Michelagnolo Buonarroti, Part 2. The name of Michelagnolo, by reason of the Pietà that he had made, the giant in Florence, and the cartoon, had become so famous that in the year 1503, Pope Alexander the Sixth, having died, and Julius the Second, having been elected, at which time Michelangelo was about twenty-nine years of age, he was summoned with much graciousness by Julius the Second, who wished to set him to make his tomb, and for the expenses of the journey, a hundred crowns were paid to him by the Pope's representatives. Having made his way to Rome, he spent many months there before he was made to set his hand to any work. But finally the Pope's choice fell on a design that he had made for that tomb, an excellent testimony to the genius of Michelangelo, which in beauty and magnificence, abundance of ornamentation, and richness of statuary, surpassed every ancient or imperial tomb. Whereupon Pope Julius took courage and thus resolved to set his hand to make anew the church of San Pietro in Rome, in order to erect the tomb in it, as has been related in another place. And so Michelagnolo set to work with high hopes, and in order to make a beginning, he went to Carrara to excavate all the marble, with two assistants, receiving a thousand crowns on that account from Alamano Salviati in Florence. There, in those mountains, he spent eight months without other monies or supplies, and he had many fantastic ideas of carving great statues in those quarries, in order to leave memorials of himself, as the ancients had done before him, being invited by those masses of stone. Then, having picked out the due quantity of marbles, he caused them to be loaded on board ship at the coast, and then conveyed to Rome, where they filled half the Piazza di San Pietro, round about Santa Caterina, and between the church and the corridor that goes to the Castello. In that place, Michelangelo had prepared his room for executing the figures, and the rest of the tomb, and to the end that the Pope might be able to come at his convenience to see him at work. He had caused a drawbridge to be constructed between the corridor and that room which led to a great intimacy between them. But in time, these favors brought much annoyance and even persecution upon him, and stirred up much envy against him among his fellow craftsmen. Of this work, Michelangelo executed during the lifetime, and after the death of Julius, four statues completely finished, and eight only blocked out, as will be related in the proper place. And since the work was designed with extraordinary invention, we will describe here below the plan that he adopted. In order to produce an effect of supreme grandeur, he decided that it should be wholly isolated, so as to be seen from all four sides, each side in one direction being twelve braccia, and each in the other eighteen, so that the proportions were a square and a half. It had a range of niches running right around the outer side which were divided one from another by terminal figures clothed from the middle upwards, which with their heads supported the first cornice, and each terminal figure had bound to it, in a strange and bizarre attitude, a naked captive, whose feet rested on a projection of the base. These captives were all provinces subjugated by that pontiff and rendered obedient to the apostolic church and there were various other statues, likewise bound, of all the noble arts and sciences, which were thus shown to be subject to death no less than was that pontiff, who made such honorable use of them. On the corners of the first cornice were to go four large figures, the active and the contemplative life, St. Paul and Moses. The structure rose above the cornice in steps gradually diminishing, with a frieze of scenes in bronze and with other figures, children and ornaments all around. And at the summit, as a crown to the work, were two figures, one of which was Heaven, who, smiling, was supporting a bier on her shoulder, 
together with Sibylle, the goddess of earth, who appeared to be grieving that she was left in a world robbed of all virtue by the death of such a man. And heaven appeared to be smiling with gladness that his soul had passed to celestial glory. The work was so arranged that one might enter and come out again by the ends of the quadrangular structure between the niches, and the interior curved in the form of an oval after the manner of a temple, in the center of which was a sarcophagus wherein was to be laid the dead body of that pope. And finally, there were to be in this whole work forty statues of marble, without counting the other scenes, children, and ornaments, the carvings covering the cornices, and the other architectural members of the work. Michelangelo ordained to expedite the labor, that a part of the marbles should be conveyed to Florence, where he intended at times to spend the summer months, in order to avoid the malaria of Rome. And there he executed one side of the work in many pieces, complete in every detail. In Rome, he finished entirely with his own hand two of the captives, figures divinely beautiful, and other statues than which none better have ever been seen. But in the end, they were never placed in position, and those captives were presented by him to Signor Roberto Strozzi, when Michelangelo happened to be lying ill in his house, which captives were afterwards sent as presents to King Francis, and they are now at Ecouen in France. Eight statues, likewise, he blocked out in Rome, and in Florence he blocked out five, and finished a victory with a captive beneath, which are now in the possession of Duke Cosimo, having been presented by Michelangelo's nephew, Leonardo, to his excellency, who has placed the victory in the great hall of his palace, which was painted by Vasari. He finished the Moses, a statue in marble of five braccia, which no modern work will ever equal in beauty, and of the ancient statues, also the same may be said. For seated in an attitude of great dignity, he rests one arm on the tables, which he holds with one hand, and with the other he holds his beard, which is long and waving, and carved in the marble in such sort that the hairs in which the sculptor finds such difficulty are wrought with the greatest delicacy, soft, feathery, and detailed in such a manner that one cannot but believe that his chisel was changed into a pencil. To say nothing of the beauty of the face, which has all the air of a true saint and most dread prince, you seem, while you gaze upon it, to wish to demand from him the veil wherewith to cover that face, so resplendent and so dazzling it appears to you. And so well has Michelangelo expressed the divinity that God infused in that most holy countenance. In addition, there are draperies carved out and finished with most beautiful curves of the borders, while the arms with their muscles and the hands with their bones and nerves are carried to such a pitch of beauty and perfection, and the legs, knees, and feet are covered with buskins so beautifully fashioned, and every part of the work is so finished that Moses may be called now, more than ever, the friend of God. Seeing that he has deigned to assemble together and prepare his body for the resurrection before that of any other, by the hands of Michelangelo, well may the Hebrews continue to go there, as they do every Sabbath, both men and women, like flocks of starlings, to visit and adore that statue, for they will be adoring a thing not human, but divine. Finally, all the agreements for this work were made, and the end came into view, and of the four sides, one of the smaller ones was afterwards erected in San Pietro in Vincola. It is said that while Michelangelo was executing the work, there came to the Ripa all the rest of the marbles for the tomb that had remained at Carrara, which were conveyed to the Piazza di San Pietro where the others were. And since it was necessary to pay those who had conveyed them, Michelangelo went, as was his custom, to the Pope. But His Holiness, having on his hands that day some important business concerning Bologna, he returned to his house and paid for those marbles out of his own purse. 
thinking to have the order for them straightway from his holiness. He returned another day to speak of them to the Pope, but found difficulty in entering, for one of the grooms told him that he had orders not to admit him, and that he must have patience. A bishop then said to the groom, Perhaps you do not know this man. Only too well do I know him, answered the groom. But I am here to do as I am commanded by my superiors and by the Pope. This action displeased Michelangelo, and considering that it was contrary to what he had experienced before, he said to the Pope's groom that he should tell His Holiness that from that time forward when he should want him. It would be found that he had gone elsewhere, and then, having returned to his house at the second hour of the night, he set out on post horses, leaving two servants to sell all the furniture of his house to the Jews and to follow him to Florence, whither he was bound. Having arrived at Bogibonzi, a place in the Florentine territory, and therefore safe, he stopped, and almost immediately five couriers arrived with letters from the Pope to bring him back. Despite their entreaties and also the letters which ordered him to return to Rome under threat of punishment, he would not listen to a word. But finally, the prayers of the couriers induced him to write a few words in reply to His Holiness, asking for pardon, but saying that he would never again return to his presence, since he had caused him to be driven away like a criminal, that his faithful service had not deserved such treatment, and that His Holiness should look elsewhere for someone to serve him. After arriving at Florence, Michelangelo devoted himself during the three months that he stayed there to finishing the cartoon for the Great Hall, which Piero Soderini, the gonfalonier, desired that he should carry into execution. During that time, there came to the Signoria three briefs commanding them to send Michelangelo back to Rome. Wherefore he, perceiving this vehemence on the part of the Pope, and not trusting him, conceived the idea, so it is said, of going to Constantinople to serve the Grand Turk, who desired to secure him, by means of certain friars of St. Francis, to build a bridge crossing from Constantinople to Pera. However, he was persuaded by Piero Soderini, although very unwilling, to go to meet the Pope as the person of public importance with the title of ambassador of the city, to reassure him. And finally, the gonfalonier recommended him to his brother, Cardinal Soderini, for presentation to the Pope, and sent him off to Bologna, where His Holiness had already arrived from Rome. His departure from Rome is also explained in another way, namely that the Pope became angered against Michelangelo, who would not allow any of his works to be seen, that Michelangelo suspected his own men, doubting, as happened more than once, that the Pope disguised himself and saw what he was doing on certain occasions when he himself was not at home or at work, and that on one occasion, when the Pope had bribed his assistants to admit him to see the chapel of his uncle Sixtus, which, as was related a little time back, he caused Bonarotti to paint. Michelangelo, having waited in hiding because he suspected the treachery of his assistants, threw planks down at the Pope when he entered the chapel, not considering who it might be, and drove him forth in a fury. It is enough for us to know that in the one way or the other he fell out with the Pope, and then became afraid, so that he had to fly from his presence. Now, having arrived in Bologna, he had scarcely drawn off his riding boots when he was conducted by the Pope's servants to His Holiness, who was in the Palazzo dei Sedici, and he was accompanied by a bishop sent by Cardinal Soderini, because the Cardinal, being ill, was not able to go himself. Having come into the presence of the Pope, Michelangelo knelt down, but His Holiness looked askance at him as if in anger, and said to him, Instead of coming yourself to meet us, you have waited for us to come to meet you, meaning to infer that Bologna is nearer to Florence than Rome. Michelangelo, with a courtly gesture of the hands, but in a firm voice, 
humbly begged for pardon, saying an excuse that he had acted as he had done in anger, not being able to endure to be driven away so abruptly, but that, if he had erred, his holiness should once more forgive him. The bishop who had presented Michelangelo to his holiness, making excuse for him, said to the Pope that such men were ignorant creatures, that they were worth nothing save in their own art, and that he should freely pardon him. The Pope, seized with anger, belabored the bishop with a staff that he had in his hand, saying to him, It is you that are ignorant, who level insults at him that we ourselves do not think of uttering. And then the bishop was driven out by the groom with fisticuffs. When he had gone, the Pope, having discharged his anger upon him, gave Michelangelo his benediction, and the master was detained in Bologna with gifts and promises, until finally His Holiness commanded him that he should make a statue of bronze in the likeness of Pope Julius, five braccia in height. In this work, he showed most beautiful art in the attitude which had an effect of much majesty and grandeur, and displayed richness and magnificence in the draperies and in the countenance, spirit, force, resolution, and stern dignity. And it was placed in a niche over the door of San Petronio. It is said that while Michelangelo was working at it, he received a visit from Francia, a most excellent goldsmith and painter, who wished to see it having heard so much praise and fame of him and of his works, and not having seen any of them, so that agents had been set to work to enable him to see it, and he had obtained permission. Whereupon, seeing the artistry of Michelangelo, he was amazed, and then, being asked by Michelangelo what he thought of that figure, Francia answered that it was a most beautiful casting and a fine material. Wherefore, Michelangelo, considering that he had praised the bronze rather than the workmanship, said to him, I owe the same obligation to Pope Julius, who has given it to me, that you owe to the apothecaries who give you your colors for painting. And in his anger, in the presence of all the gentlemen there, he declared that Francia was a fool. In the same connection, when a son of Francia's came before him and was announced as a very beautiful youth, Michelangelo said to him, Your father's living figures are finer than those that he paints. Among the same gentlemen was one, whose name I know not, who was Michelangelo, which he thought was the larger, the statue of the Pope, or a pair of oxen. And he answered, That depends on the oxen. If there are these Bolognese oxen, then without a doubt our Florentine oxen are not so big. Michelangelo had the statue finished in clay before the Pope departed from Bologna for Rome, and His Holiness, having gone to see it, but not knowing what was to be placed in the left hand, and seeing the right hand raised in a proud gesture, asked whether it was pronouncing a benediction or a curse. Michelangelo answered that it was admonishing the people of Bologna to mind their behavior, and asked His Holiness to decide whether he should place a book in the left hand, and he said, Put a sword there, for I know nothing of letters. The Pope left a thousand crowns in the bank of M. Anton Maria da Lignano for the, con for the completion of the statue, and at the end of the sixteen months that Michelangelo toiled over the work, it was placed on the frontispiece in the façade of the church of San Petronio, as has been related and we have also spoken of its size. This statue was destroyed by the Venti Vogli, and the bronze was sold to Duke Alfonso of Ferrara, who made with it a piece of artillery called La Giulia, saving only the head, which is to be found in his Guadra Roba.
When the Pope had returned to Rome and Michelangelo was at work on the statue, Bramante, the friend and relative of Raffaello da Rabino, and for that reason, little the friend of Michelangelo, perceiving that the Pope held in great favor and estimation the works that he executed in sculpture, was constantly planning with Raffaello in Michelangelo's absence to remove from the mind of his holiness the idea of causing Michelangelo, after his return, to devote himself to finishing his tomb, saying that for a man to prepare himself a tomb during his own lifetime was an evil augury and a hurrying on of his death. And they persuaded his holiness that on the return of Michelangelo, he should cause him to paint in memory of his uncle Sixtus the vaulting of the chapel that he had built in the palace. In this manner, it seemed possible to Bramante and other rivals of Michelangelo to draw him away from sculpture, in which they saw him to be perfect, and to plunge him into despair, they thinking that if they compelled him to paint, he would do work less worthy of praise, since he had no experience of colors in fresco, and that he would prove inferior to Raffaello, and even if he did succeed in the work, in any case, it would make him angry against the Pope, so that in either event they would achieve their object of getting rid of him. And so, when Michelangelo returned to Rome, the Pope was not disposed at that time to finish his tomb, and requested him to paint the vaulting of the chapel. Michelangelo, who desired to finish the tomb, believing the vaulting of that chapel to be a great and difficult labor, and considering his own want of practice in colors, sought by every means to shake such a burden from his shoulders, and proposed Raphael for the work. But the more he refused, the greater grew the desire of the Pope, who was headstrong in his undertakings, and in addition, was being spurned on anew by the rivals of Michelangelo, and especially by Bramante, so that his holiness, who was quick-tempered, was on the point of becoming enraged with Michelangelo, whereupon Michelangelo, perceiving that his holiness was determined in the matter, resolved to do it, and the Pope commanded Bramante to erect the scaffolding from which the vaulting might be painted. Bramante made it all supported by ropes, piercing the vaulting, which having perceived Michelangelo in quite of Bramante, how he was to proceed to fill up the holes when he had finished painting it and he replied that he would think of that afterwards and that it could not be done otherwise michelangelo recognized that bramante was either not very competent for such a work or else little his friend and he went to the pope and said to him that the scaffolding was not satisfactory and that bramante had not known how to make it and the pope answered in the presence of bramante that he should make it after his own fashion and so he commanded that it should be erected upon props so as not to touch the walls a method of making scaffoldings for vaults that he taught afterwards to bramante and others whereby many fine works have been executed thus he enabled a poor creature of a carpenter who rebuilt the scaffolding to dispense with so many of the ropes that after selling them for michelangelo gave them to him he made up a dowry for his daughter he then set his hand to making the cartoons for that vaulting and the Pope decided, also, that the walls which the masters before him in the time of Sixtus had painted should be scraped clean, and decreed that he should have fifteen thousand ducats for the whole cost of the work, which price was fixed to Giuliano de Sangallo. Thereupon, forced by the magnitude of the undertaking to resign himself to a painting assistance, Michelangelo sent for men to Florence, and he determined to demonstrate in such a work that those who had painted there before him were destined to be vanquished by his labors, and also resolved to show to the modern craftsmen how to draw and paint. Having begun the cartoons, he finished them, and the circumstances of the work spurred him to soar to great heights, both for his own fame and for the welfare of art, and then, desiring to paint it in fresco colors, and not having any experience of them, there came from Florence to Rome certain friends of his, who were painters, in the end that they might give him assistance in such a work, and also that he might learn from them the method of working in fresco, in which some of them were well practiced, and among those were Granaccio, Giuliano Burgandini, Jacopo di Sandro, the elder Indico, Agnolo di Donino and Aristotele. Having made a commencement with the work, he caused them to begin some things as specimens, but perceiving that their efforts were very far from what he desired, and not being satisfied with them, he resolved one morning to throw to the ground everything that he had done. Then, shutting himself in the chapel, he would never open to them, nor even allow himself to be seen by them when he was at home and so when the jest appeared to them to be going too far they resigned themselves to it and returned in shame to florence thereupon michelangelo having made arrangements to paint the whole work by himself carried it well on the way to completion with the utmost solicitude labor and study nor would he ever let himself be seen, lest he should give any occasion to compel him to show it, so that the desire of the minds of every one to see it grew every day. Pope Julius was always very desirous to see any undertakings that he was having carried out, and therefore became more eager than ever to see this one, which was hidden from him, and so one day he resolved to go see it, but was not admitted, for Michelangelo would never have consented to show it to him, out of which affair arose the quarrel that he had described, 
which he had to depart from Rome, because he would not show his work to the Pope. Now when a third of the work was finished, as I ascertained from him, in order to clear up all doubts, it began to throw out certain spots of mold. One winter that the north wind was blowing, the reason of this was that the Roman lime, which is made of travertine, in white in color, does not dry very readily, and, when mixed with pozzolana, which is of a tawny color, makes a dark mixture which, when soft, is very watery, and when the wall has been well soaked, it often breaks out in an efflorescence in the drying, and thus this salt efflorescence of moisture came out in many places, but in time the air consumed it. Michelangelo was in despair over this, and was unwilling to continue the work, asking the Pope to excuse him, since he was not succeeding, but his holiness sent Giuliano de Sangallo to see him, and he, having told him whence the defect arose, and taught him how to remove the spots of mold, encouraged him to persevere. Now when he had finished half of it, the Pope, who had subsequently gone to see it several times, mounting certain ladders with the assistance of Michelangelo, insisted that it should be thrown open, for he was hasty and impatient by nature, and could not wait for it to be completely finished, and to receive, as the saying is, the final touch. No sooner was it thrown open than all Rome was drawn to see it, and the Pope was the first, not having the patience to wait until the dust caused by the dismantling of the scaffolding had settled. Thereupon Raffaello d'Arbino, who was very excellent in imitation, after seeing it straight away changed his manner, and without losing any time, in order to display his ability, painted the prophets and sibyls in the work of the pace, and at the same time, Bramante sought to have the other half of the chapel in trusted by the Pope to Raffaello, which hearing, Michelangelo complained of Romante, and revealed to the Pope, without any reserve, many faults both in his life and in his architectural works, of which last in the building of St. Pietro, as was seen afterwards, Michelangelo became the corrector. But the Pope, recognizing more clearly every day the ability of Michelangelo, desired that he should continue the work, judging, after he had seen it uncovered, that he could make the second half considerably better, and so in twenty months he carried that work to perfect completion by himself alone, without the assistance even of anyone to grind his colors. Michelangelo complained at times that on account of the haste that the Pope imposed on him, he was not able to finish it in his own fashion, as he would have liked, for His Holiness was always asking him, importantly, when he would finish it. On one occasion, among others, he replied, it will be finished when I shall have satisfied myself in the matter of art. But it is our pleasure, answered the Pope, that you should satisfy us in our desire to have it done quickly. And he added, finally, that if Michelangelo did not finish the work quickly, he would have him thrown down from the scaffolding. Whereupon Michelangelo, who feared and had good reason to fear the anger of the Pope, straightway finished all that was wanting, without losing any time, and after taking down the rest of the scaffolding, threw it open to view on the morning of All Saints' Day, when the Pope went into the chapel to sing Mass, to the great satisfaction of the whole city. Michelangelo desired to retouch some parts a secco, as the old masters had done, on the scenes below, painting backgrounds, draperies, and skies in ultramarine, and ornaments in gold in certain places, to the end that this might produce greater richness and a more striking effect. And the Pope, having learned that this ornamentation was wanting, and hearing the work praised so much by all who had seen it, wished him to finish it. But, since it would have been too long a labor for Michelangelo to rebuild the scaffolding, it was left as it is. His Holiness, often seeing Michelangelo, would say to him that the chapel should be enriched with colors and gold, since it looked poor. And Michelangelo would answer familiarly, Holy Father, in those times men did not bedeck themselves with gold, and those that are painted there were never very rich, but rather holy men, on which account they despised riches. For this work, Michelangelo was paid by the Pope three thousand crowns on several occasions, of which he had to spend twenty-five on colors. The work was executed with very great discomfort to himself, from his having to labor with his face upwards, which so impaired his sight, and for a time, which was not less than several months, he was not able to read letters or look at drawings save with his head backwards. And to this I can bear witness, having painted five vaulted chambers in the great apartments in the palace of Duke Cosimo, when, if I had not made a chair on which I could rest my head and lie down at my work, I would never have finished it. Even so, it has so ruined my sight and injured my head that I still feel the effects, and I am astonished that Michelangelo endured all that discomfort so well. But in truth, becoming more and more kindled every day by his fervor in the work, and encouraged by the proficiency and improvement that he made, he felt no fatigue and cared nothing for discomfort. The distribution of this work is contrived with six pendentives on either side, with one in the center of the walls at the foot and at the head, and on these he painted sibyls and prophets, six brachi.
Nokia in height. In the center of the vault, the history of the world from the creation down to the deluge and the drunkenness of Noah, and in the lunettes, all the genealogy of Christ. In these compartments, he used no rule of perspectives in foreshortening, nor is there any fixed point of view, but he accommodated the compartments to the figures rather than the figures to the compartments. Being satisfied to execute those figures, both the nude and the draped, with the perfection of design, so that another such work has never been seen and never can be done and it is scarcely possible even to imitate his achievement. This work, in truth, has been and still is the lamp of our art, and has bestowed such benefits and shed so much light on the art of painting that it has served to illuminate a world that has lain in darkness for so many hundreds of years. And it is certain that no man who is a painter need think any more to see new inventions, attitudes, and draperies for the clothing of figures, novel manners of expression, and things painted with greater variety and force, because he gave to this work all the Perfection that can be given to any work executed in such a field of art. And at the present day, everyone is amazed who is able to perceive in it the excellence of the figures, the perfection of the foreshortenings, and the extraordinary roundness of the contours, which having in them slenderness and grace, being drawn with the beauty of proportion that is seen in beautiful nudes, and these, in order to display the supreme perfection of art, he made of all ages, different in expression and in form, in countenance and in outline, some more slender and some fuller in the members, as may also be seen in the beautiful attitudes, which are all different, some seated, some moving, and others upholding certain festoons of oak leaves and acorns, placed there as the arms and device of Pope Julius, and signifying that at that time, and under his government, was the age of gold. For Italy was not in the travail and misery that she has since suffered. Between them, also, they hold some medallions containing stories and relief, in imitation of bronze and gold, taken from the Book of Kings. Besides this, in order to display the perfection of art and also the greatness of God, he painted in a scene, God dividing light from darkness, wherein he may be seen his majesty, as he rests self-sustained with the arms outstretched, and reveals both love and power. In the second scene, he depicted with most beautiful judgment and genius, God creating the sun and moon, in which he is supported by many little angels, in an attitude sublime and terrible by reason of the foreshortenings in the arms and legs. In the same scene, Michelangelo depicted him after the blessing of the earth and the creation of the animals, when he is seen on that vaulting as a figure flying in foreshortening, and wherever you go throughout the chapel, it turns constantly and faces in every direction. So all also, in the next scene, where he is dividing the water from the earth, and both these are very beautiful figures and refinements of genius, such as could be produced only by the divine hands of Michelangelo. He then went on, beyond that scene, to the creation of Adam, wherein he figured God as born by a group of nude angels under tender age, which appeared to be supporting not one figure only, but the whole weight of the world, this effect being produced by the venerable majesty of his form, and by the manner of the movement from which he embraces some of the little angels with one arm as if to support himself, and with the other extends the right hand towards Adam, a figure of such a kind in its beauty, in the attitude, and in the outlines, that it appears as if newly fashioned by the first and supreme creator, rather than by the brush and design of a mortal man. Beyond this, in another scene, he made God taking our mother Eve from Adam's side, in which may be seen these two nude figures, one as it were dead from his being the thrall of sleep, and the other becoming alive and filled with animation by the blessing of God. Very clearly do we see from the brush of this most gifted craftsman the difference that there is between sleep and wakefulness, and how firm and stable, speaking humanly, the divine majesty may appear. Next to this, there follows the scene when Adam, at the persuasion of a figure, half woman and half serpent, brings death upon himself and upon us by the forbidden fruit, and there, also, are seen Adam and Eve driven from paradise. In the figure of the angel is shown with nobility and grandeur, the execution of the mandate of a wrathful lord, and in the attitude of Adam, the sorrow for his sin together with the fear of death, as likewise in the woman may be seen shame, abasement, and the desire to implore pardon as she presses the arms to the breast, clasps the hands palm to palm, and sinks the neck into the bosom, and also turns the head towards the angel, having more fear of the justice of God than hope in his mercy. Nor is there less beauty in the story of the sacrifice of Cain and Abel, wherein are some who are bringing up the wood, some who are bent down, and blowing at the fire, and others who are cutting the throat of the victim, which certainly, in all executed, and not less consideration and attention than the others. He showed the same art and the same judgment in the story of the deluge, wherein are seen various deaths of men, who, terrified by the horror of those days,
ways are striving their utmost in different ways to save their lives. For in the faces of those figures may be seen life a prey to death, not less than fear, terror, and disregard of everything, and compassion is visible in many that are assisting one another to climb to the summit of a rock in search of safety. Among them, one who, having embraced one half-dead, is striving his utmost to save him, than which nature herself could show nothing better. Nor can I tell how well expressed is the story of Noah, who, drunk with wine, is sleeping naked, and has before him one son who is laughing at him, and two are who are covering him up, a scene incomparable in the beauty of the artistry, and not to be surprised past saved by himself alone. Then, as if his genius had taken courage from what it had achieved up to that time, it soared upwards and proved itself even greater in the five sibyls and seven prophets that are painted there. Each five brachia are more in height, and all these are well-varied attitudes, beautiful draperies, and different vestments, and all, in a word, are wrought with marvelous intention and judgment, and to him who can distinguish their expressions, they appear divine. Jeremiah is seen with the legs crossed, holding one hand to the beard, and resting that elbow on the knee, the other hand rests in his lap, and he has his head bowed in a manner that clearly demonstrates the melancholy, cogitation, anxious thought, and bitterness of soul that his people cause him. Equally fine, also, are two little children that are behind him, and likewise the first sibyl, beyond him in the direction of the door, in which figure, wishing to depict old age, in addition to enveloping her in draperies, he sought to show that her blood is already frozen by time, besides which, since her sight has become feeble, he has made her, as she reads, bring the book very close to her eyes. Beyond this figure follows the prophet Ezekiel, an old man, who has a grace and a movement that are most beautiful, and is much enveloped in draperies, while with one hand he holds a roll of prophecy and with the other uplifted. Turning his head, he appears to be about to utter great and lofty words, and behind him he has two boys who hold his books. Next to him follows a sibyl, who is doing the contrary to the Erythaean sibyl that we described above. For holding her book away from her, she seeks to turn a page, while with one knee over the other she sits sunk within herself, pondering gravely over what she is to write. And then a boy who is behind her, blowing on a burning brand, lights her lamp. This figure of extraordinary beauty and the expression of the face, in the headdress, and in the arrangement of the draperies, besides which she has the arms nude, which are equal to the other parts. Beyond the sibyl, he painted the prophet Joel, who sunk within himself, has taken a scroll and reads it with great attention and appreciation, and from his aspect it is so clearly evident that he is satisfied with that which he finds written there, and he looks like a living person who has applied his thoughts intently to some matter. Over the door of the chapel, likewise, he placed the aged Zacharias, who is seeking through his written book for something that he cannot find, stands with one leg on high and the other low, while the ardor of the search after something that he cannot find causes him to stand thus. He takes no notice of the discomfort that he suffers in such a posture. This figure is very beautiful in its aspects of old age, and somewhat full in form, and has draperies with few folds, which are most beautiful. In addition, there is another sibyl, who is next in the direction of the altar on the other side, displaying certain writings, and with her boys in attendance, is no less worthy of praise than are the others. Beyond her is the prophet Isaiah, who, wholly absorbed in his own thoughts, has the legs crossed over one another, and holding one hand to his book to mark the place where he was reading, has placed the elbow of the other arm upon the book, with the cheek pressed against the hand, and, being called by one of the boys that he has behind him, he turns only the head, without disturbing himself otherwise. Whoever shall consider his countenance shall see touches truly taken from nature herself, the true mother of art, and a figure which, when well studied in every part, can teach in liberal measure all the precepts of the good painter. Beyond this prophet is an aged sibyl of great beauty, who, as she sits, studies from a book in an attitude of extraordinary grace, not to speak of the beautiful attitudes of the two boys that are about her. Nor may any man think with all his imaginings to be able to attain the excellence of the figure of a youth representing Daniel, who, writing in a great book, is taking certain things from other writings and copying them with extraordinary attention. And as a support for the weight of the book, Michelangelo painted a boy between his legs, who is upholding it while he writes all which no brush held by a human hand, however skillful, will ever be able to equal. And so, also with the beautiful figure of the Libyan Sibyl, who having written a great volume, drawn from many books, is in an attitude of womanly grace, as if about to rise to her feet. And in one, in the same movement, she makes as if to rise and to close the book, a thing most difficult, not to say impossible, for any other but the master of the work. And what can be said of the four scenes at the corners, on the spandrels, of that vaulting, in one of which David, with all the boyish strength, 
strength he can expect in the conquest of a giant is cutting off his head, bringing marvel to the faces of some soldiers who are about the camp. And so, also, they men marvel at the beautiful attitudes that Michelangelo depicted in the story of Judith, at the opposite corner, in which may be seen the trunk of Holofernes, robbed of life but still quivering, while Judith is placing the lifeless head in a basket on the head of her old serving woman, who, being tall in stature, is stooping to the end that Judith may be able to reach up to her and adjust the weight well and the servant while upholding the burden with her hands seeks to conceal it and turning her head towards the trunk which although dead draws up an arm and a leg and makes a noise in the tent she shows in her expression fear of the camp and terror of the dead body a picture truly full of thought but more beautiful and more divine than this or any of the others is the story of the serpents of moses which is above the left-hand corner of the altar for the reason that in it is seen the havoc wrought by death the reign of serpents their stings and their bites and there may also be perceived the serpent of brass that moses placed upon a pole in this scene are shown vividly the various deaths that those die who are robbed of all hope by the bite of the serpents and one sees the deadly venom causing vast numbers to die in terror and convulsions to say nothing of the rigid legs and twisted arms of those who remain in the attitudes in which they were struck down unable to move and the marvellous heads that are shrieking and thrown backwards in despair not less beautiful than all are those who having looked upon the serpent and feeling their pains alleviated by the sight of it are gazing on it with profound emotion and among them is a woman who is supported by another figure in such a manner that the assistance rendered to her by him who upholds her is no less manifest than her pressing need in such sudden alarm and hurt in the next scene likewise in which ahasuerus reclining in a bed is reading his chronicles are figures of great beauty and among them three figures eating at a table which represent the council that was held for the deliverance of the jewish people and the hanging of haman the figure of haman was executed by michelangelo in an extraordinary manner of foreshortening for he counterfeited the trunk that supports his person and that arm which comes forward not as painted things but as real and natural standing out in relief and so also that leg which he stretches outwards and other parts that bend inwards which figure among all that are beautiful and difficult as certainly the most beautiful and the most difficult 